Welcome to McCallion and McCallion uh, and our workshop on landscaping and curb appeal. Uh, my name is Susan McCallion and I'm joined by my husband Jim McCallion. And today we have with us Lee Gavinger. Gavlinger, sorry, I hope I didn't pronounce your name too terribly wrong. But no, that's perfect, thank you. Lee and Jim and I got to know each other when a few years ago, Jim and I decided to redo our yard. And um, we interviewed lots of different landscape designers and really felt very comfortable with Lee and having her help us work through the plan of our own yard and uh, plants and the type of field that we were looking for. And she was able to work with us and make changes as we went along. And she was just amazing in every single way. So um, Jim knows an awful lot about um, different types of plants. So uh, she was able to work with us and, and get her input. So I'm really excited to have Lee join us here today. Um, she's got a wealth of knowledge and uh, I think that you'll enjoy hearing from her. At the end of our talk today, I'll show you two screens. One is just uh, reconnecting you to information on getting in touch with either Jim or I, and even more importantly, an information screen for Lee and how you can get in touch with Lee if you have any further questions or would like uh, to have her come visit your house. So we're going to start right in. Um, Jim and I own McCallionRealty.com. We have a team of caring, wonderful professionals that work with us to help uh, people buy and sell real estate in Southwest Florida. We've got two offices, one on Sanibel and Captiva Islands and the other in Fort Myers area. So we're here if you have questions along your real estate path. Uh, or if you want just some good information on lifestyle in Southwest Florida. Uh, Lee, this is you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about when you started Coastal Vista and what, what brought you to your career? Um, well, I am a licensed landscape architect. Um, so I went to school, I'm actually from Madison, Wisconsin, um, or from Wisconsin, went to school at Madison graduated from the landscape architecture program. Um, I have always liked um, being artistic and really when I found out there was a path where you could be artistic and also um, realize that creativity in the landscape, um, I really gravitated towards that. Um, so, and I've started Coastal Vista Design. Um, I've been a landscape architect for 14 years, started Coastal Vista Design in 2016 um, I have an office here on Sanibel, uh, it's where I'm sitting right now, um, and when I met Jim and Susan, it was just me uh, at the beginning of my budding Coastal Vista Design office and career, but um, almost four years later, I have uh, four other um, teammates um, on Coastal Vista Design, and we do residential, we do commercial, we do um, public spaces, we you know, so we're available for consulting, for ideas, for landscape plans, um, for construction administration, kind of, kind of everything you can think about with landscape, we can do. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Um, and you do work throughout Southwest Florida, or do you focus primarily on Sanibel and Captiva? So we have um, a good base of our uh, clients and projects our Sanibel and Captiva, especially our residential projects. Um, but we do work in Collier and Lee County. So um, in currently we actually have a really big project in Lee, uh, Collier County. The client is Collier County and it is the new Paradise, Sport, or Paradise Coast Sports Complex. So we are finishing uh, phase one of that. Um, we have been able to really fortunately partner with uh, Naples Botanical Garden on that project and that has been a like a really wonderful experience so um we're getting you yeah, know, sounds we're, exciting yeah we're able to learn from them uh you know so much of what we're doing uh it's just exciting so very cool yeah very cool all right 
What is curb appeal? Lee? <laughs> um, well, we, yes, curb appeal um, is, is many different things, but so often I feel like the landscape is probably one of the biggest factors that contributes to either a positive or negative aesthetic that is curb appeal. Um, the image that you see is a residential project on Captiva, and this is after landscape renovation um, and a complete home renovation. Um, so you'll see new siding, new paint, new screen, new windows, um, you know, so, but curb appeal really is that very first impression that um, I ex actually experience curb appeal every time I go to visit with a residential client. You know, it's, um, we get the question on how do we improve our curb appeal from um, owners or from owners that are wishing to sell. And then oftentimes um, new buyers also want to improve their own curb appeal. So um, it's, to me, it's more of a organization of the landscape and how it responds to the existing home or also, um, you know, it could be something as simple as just adding color or it could, you know, require a complete tear out and remodel. Um, but curb appeal is essentially your first impression. And yeah, I, it, it is absolutely. It's a first impression. And I agree with you, Lee. I think that a lot of times people think of curb appeal and they think of what color they're going to paint the house or anything they can do to dress up the house, the physical structure. But the yard and the planting around the yard really sets off the whole first impression of a house. And, and I think oftentimes people underestimate the impact that that has on people's impression of a property. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to emphasize from a real estate point of view that um, not only is curb appeal, um, you, know, you know, curb appeal is one of those things you can do to add value to your house. And there's a definitely a good return on investment on things that you do for curb appeal. You've heard it all the time. Um, landscape is part of that. And um, one of the things I want to point out to people is that not only do we have as real estate agents, when we pull into a driveway with, with, with clients in the car, do we get clients look at us and say, we don't want to go any further, or we're really not interested in looking at this house just from the curb appeal? You know, so that sometimes ends the discussion right there. Um, and even if they don't say that to us, they may have decided or put a big negative mark in that house that that first impression is going to be really hard to overcome if the, if the curb appeal is, is bad, um, if it has low curb appeal. If on the, on the flip side, of course, a house that's pretty on the outside definitely makes people want to see what's going to be on the inside. And in today's day and age of the internet, we advertise and market homes for people. It's what we do. And um, man, it's hard when the pictures don't look at the house on the outside. <laughs> it's a, it makes our job very difficult to get people to want to come to your house and look at it um, to even put an offer on the property um, if the pictures look bad and the landscaping on the exterior of the home has a lot to do with how those pictures look when we market your house. So anyway, I wanted to really emphasize that point. So if I could add to um, Jim's point and here, we're kind of segueing into the color. Um, we actually recently, surprisingly, even with um, the kind of the COVID situation, have had quite a few um, owners out here contact us and ask us, you know, we're thinking about selling, um, what would you recommend we do um, to increase our curb appeal? And this first slide, honestly, is one of the most important um, recommendations that we can give is just adding color. Um, and to add color does not need to be an expensive um, endeavor. You can add a really quick um, boost of color to the landscape just by incorporating annuals. Um, they give you, whether it's, um, summer and spring season or fall season annuals, um, it, it, it can actually, you know, if you spend $400 on some annuals, it is proven um, in some stats that we have read um, and been aware of for a few years to return the investment by as much as nine times. Like just adding that amount of color to the landscape, it just, you know, it, it gives um, 
they don't stop like Jim had said and you know kind of not like what they're seeing it's just it's really easy to add and it can be the annuals on the bottom um, like the low line annuals or it could be you know a couple standard bougainvillea just something to you know excite uh, and set off the landscape so um, so yeah, I think that's a great point. You don't, what you're saying is that you don't necessarily mean that you have to do a complete, you know, landscape mm -hmm. to improve your curb appeal. You can just put in some bedding plants, some flowers, some simple flowers can make a big difference. So areas where we find um, that are easiest to incorporate the curb appeal, um, if you're just trying to incorporate annual color would be around the mailbox, maybe right at the street view. Um, focus on areas along the driveway because that is your experience as you, you know, go from the street to the front door and definitely focus on the front door. You don't need to um, go around the entire perimeter of the house, um, but maybe around the front walk. Just those select areas are, are kind of the key areas to focus on um, for color and especially if you're trying to do it in a budget friendly fashion. So. Okay. Great suggestion. So um, another thing just for increasing the curb appeal is to do like a trim. Uh, our, we're in Florida, we don't have winter. Our growing season is all year long. Um, and especially in the summer, things grow much, much quicker. Um, and we have found if you can trim and organize even an existing hedge, um, just so that you don't have overgrowth or um, unsightly growth, that that helps to just create a, kind of an order um, to the landscape. So here it's, you know, it's as simple as a native cocoa plum foundation hedge. Um, this hedge had been allowed to grow about three feet, was covering half of the windows. And from a real estate standpoint or a homeowner standpoint, your views are from the window out. This one fortunately has a, a view of the bay. So, I mean, just proper trimming and proper maintenance um, can do a lot. Um, and then, you know, large swaths of planting, it, it can be simple. It doesn't have to be um, four or five different kinds of plants, just one or two very simple plantings um, can also add to the organization of the um, design, um, you know. So it doesn't have to be a complicated um, project to just, you know, dress up the home or, or clean up the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that when we're shopping for plants at Home Depot and trying to pick out things, we see, oh, let's get a couple of these and a couple of these and a couple of these, and you end up with, you know, three or four plants of, uh, of, of 10 different varieties that you plant into a bed. And it ends up just kind of looking like mishmash when you're done. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. I, th I see, I've done that, and I, I've seen that a lot with people's home landscaping. So what, I, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm looking at this picture here that looks really engaging to me, is that I'm only seeing a couple different plants there, and that that, that can really work well. It can, and these, what you're seeing in this image, it's 100% it's native planting um, here, it just, it, and it looks great. It doesn't have to be hibiscus or bougainvillea everywhere, but um, to Jim's, to your point, um, if you want to do kind of, you know, that area of like pick, an a pick a small area of your property to kind of try those one or two or three things, don't try to do it throughout the entire property. Um, so that would be another recommendation because, I mean, I am guilty, but I love to go to Home Depot and I want to try this and this and this and, you know, but I have a small kind of, I guess you could say, uh, um, trial and error spot. Um, for myself, but if you're going to do it, maybe pick a small area to try that within and see what works for your property um, and then, you know, implement it in the landscape. Mm -hmm. so. I have a question for you, Lee. Um, if you're planning, uh, maybe you've got a family wedding happening in the backyard and you want your shrubberies to look beautiful for that, or you're listing your house and you want the curb appeal to be ideal at that time, how much time do you need to give to make those trims and have them grow so they look natural and they yeah. look the way they should when you want them to look their best? So that's a great question. Um, so we, 
we would recommend to coordinate um, with either your landscape maintenance person or if you're doing it yourself, just consider the time of year. So if it's in the summer, um, our rate of growth, regrowth is very quick. So you might wanna just do four weeks, but if it's in the winter and we're not getting as much rain and we're not as, much, as humid, um, you may wanna give it six weeks, six, four to six weeks, like trim then. And then within that time, it'll be ready to photograph um, for, for images. Um, so there, it's definitely a coordinated, timely effort um, that can give you, it can, it can work much better because um, right now in the summer, especially early summer, you'll notice that many, many landscapers cut everything back really hard. Um, and so I went to try to go photograph a couple properties that were pretty two weeks ago and they're all hard cut back. Um, but I just know that I need to give four to, you know, about four weeks and I can go back and take photos and we'll have blooms again. So I, that's, that's my recommendation is it's figure out what season you're in um, and then either coordinate with your landscape contractor or call me and ask me, I'm happy to help. Um, so yeah, you want to give things a little time to regrow so they don't, they don't look so harsh. So um, Jim said something interesting and you echoed it and that was repeating colors. I remember when you came to work on our yard, I felt like a girl in the candy shop. I wanted to get every color in the rainbow in our yard everywhere. And you and Jim did a very nice, respectful way of calming me down and getting me focused on, you know, a few things. And our yard looks great because of it. So how do you know is how do you know when you're working with too much color or how do you kind of rein that in? Well, number one, it, it's it's tough and it's it's actually um, on a case by case basis. So uh, we get as a, as a designer, my uh, main goal is to understand what the client's wishes are and figure out how to best realize those wishes without allowing some mistakes to happen. You know, we want to minimize any sort of um, mistakes, if you will. And when I say that, I really mean for a landscape, if I can, I try to say, well, okay, do you prefer primary colors, reds, yellows? greens or do you prefer sort of the pastel and, and pinks and soft colors? Like I try to figure out a theme and a rhythm and then let that um, kind of guide our direction with our plant palette. Um, I do try to avoid every color of pink and every color of red and every color of yellow um, all together in a landscape. Um, if it's a large enough property, we can do that or we can do different themes, just a different theme in the front and a different theme in the back. Um, but I try not to do it all where when you step out, it's all visual, all the same in the same um, vision. I just, to me that you want to avoid that. So if we want to use a bunch of color, we just have to be um, cognizant and careful about how we want to use it and where we want to use it. So okay. it's not a direct answer, but I'm, you know, it's, we do try to guide away from certain things and towards others, but it's really, it's directed by you know, the end wishes of the client. Great. One thing I'm going to add from a real estate perspective, which may be a little different than, an, than your wishes as a homeowner, and that is um, you mentioned that you want to make sure you maintain the view that your windows are like pictures, right? You're in the house, you're looking out, and you have a beautiful view. So you don't want plants obscuring that view, or maybe you do want plants obscuring the view a little further out if it isn't a desirable view. But um, I think generally we want to have the house have as, as much natural light coming in as possible. It makes a big difference when you're showing a property and when people's impressions of a property is the amount of natural light. Um, sometimes we like to minimize natural light for energy efficiency and things like that. But when you're actually showing the house for resale, um, it's really great if we can get more natural light. So when you trim, think a little bit about that too. Think about what is it something that, is there something I can do that may add more light to the inside of my house? Is that worth the trade-off if I'm going to cut back a plant that I, I feel is attractive, but may be causing a lot of shade in one of my major windows? You may consider tr trimming it for the sake of getting light in your house. Because I think that's an important thing that we need, you want to consider when you're looking at your landscape in the house. So we, we use the term um, view windows, essentially. Um, for trimming up 
um, like sea grape or you know any of our native trees, we can we can either limb up some of the trees and keep the canopy up above the window so you can see through and out, or we can thin out the canopy for more direct light. But there, yes, there, natural light is a huge thing. Um, it just really improves your overall sense of the space. Um, and so we do like to, we do like to make sure that you know actually people call me over to do a landscape consultation and very often we end up inside looking from their inside space out and discussing how do we want to handle this area how do we want to handle this tree or this shrub or this palm so oftentimes things just grow so fast here so you you trim it last year and it happens over you know a period of time and you don't even realize it and with me with a fresh look i can say oh well here's all you have to do to trim this we'll get it right back to where you need it but um, you know, so it's, it's just that sort of Florida. I mean, it's, it's, we have a lot of fast growth, so. Can you talk a little bit about this picture here? Um, yeah, this is actually an example of kind of a monochromatic planting. Um, it is a shady location and we were able to incorporate a lot of different leaf texture um, and leaf shape and size. Um, and it's, and then by the use of like a lighter, lighter um, shell, uh, pathway shell pathway pathway. that we have, we were able to, that the shell actually helps to brighten up the entire experience of the space at the ground plane. So it, it it's, it's very tropical. Um, it's actually the side yard of a client's house. And really the house is just to the left of the screen, maybe like four feet. And then the property line is another four feet to the right. So you're talking about maybe 12 to 15 feet of space. Um, but with um, layers of lush uh, leaf planting, it really can feel very tropical in a very small space. It's one of my favorite side yards that we've done. It's I gorgeous. It. I, I, love, I love tropical plantings like that. That's, that's, my, that's my kind of landscape. No grass to mow. Exactly. <laughs> no, no grass for the rabbits to eat either. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So Jim, is this your vision for our side yard? Well, we have a we have a wider side yard, so that's only the beginning of my vision of the side. Yard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so wait, but before we we get off the talk on on uh, on mulch, I, I oh yeah, because it's not just the look there. You're talking about mulch and 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 the and the dressing of the ground and how important that is, and um, and that bright path made a really big difference, but it's also the fact that there's that kind of clean bed of mulch that, that really kind of dresses that space up a lot. Makes it a little more, you know, makes it look a little bit more like something intentional versus just a, 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 a rainforest. So mulch, um, top dressing of mulch is also one really fast and easy thing that any homeowner, any potential buyer, or I'm sorry, seller could do to increase their curb appeal. Um, and the mulch that you see in this image is a grade A cypress mulch. It's uh, really finely shredded. It is a premium quality mulch. Um, so, it, and it has, it's not colored, so it's actually a natural color. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, one of the first things that we recommend aside from seasonal or adding color to the landscape is to mulch in um, maybe even top dress the shell because the shell after you know a few years of use and a bunch of rain can start to um, spread or uh, migrate. Um, so just that alone, even with existing plantings, can really transform the landscape. Um, when we're talking mulch, we, I mentioned the grade A cypress. There's also like a cocoa brown. Um, there's other cypress blends. We also have a pine needle mulch. So depending on the type of mulch you use, you can also communicate the level of, um, kind of the level of character that you want your landscape to have. Like if I'm using a pine needle mulch, that's more in a natural area for a very native setting. Um, also, you know, needle is very good for rain gardens, whereas this mulch, it will float and move if we have rain events, if water pools um, like in a low area. So um, this mulch is perfect for the location um, but you know, not perfect for every location. We have a, yeah, go ahead, Sue. 
Uh, we have a new listing that just came on and they used, they did exactly this and they used the pine, uh, pine needles in their front yard area and it looks like a secret garden. It's gorgeous and they did the shell. Um, yeah. The before and after pictures are amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and the main thing they did was trim, they did trimming, they put in a path, a shell path and they put in mulch and it just made it look like like a gar it made it look like a really neat like you said like a secret garden whereas before it just looked like a bunch of kind of overgrown plants and it's I mean it it was pretty they had nice foundation plants but when they dressed it up it really popped so, I'm gonna make one comment though here because my environmentalist side comes out a little bit you said this was cypress mulch yep is that a concern as an you know from an environmental standpoint that they're grinding up cypress trees to make that mulch. It is actually, it definitely is. So to that point, um, the city of Sanibel does highly discourages using of Cypress mulch. Um, the mulch that is here, this was taken about four years ago. Well, actually, I'm sorry, no. It was planted five years ago. I took this photo a year ago. Um, this one is on Captiva. So they, on Captiva, they don't have to follow the Sanibel guidelines, but mm -hmm. Cypress mulch is that much more expensive because it, you know, I don't agree with deforestation of cypress either. They're very slow growing trees. Um, but yeah, so that is a concern and it just really, it depends. So what's we, the best alternative for cypress mulch, do you think? If you didn't want to use cypress mulch because of that, you, but you wanted to have a, a, something that's a quality mulch that gives us so similar. They have cypress blends, but that is isn't 100% cypress free. So if you wanted to go cypress free, they do have um, what they call like a cocoa brown mulch. It's just a darker brown mulch. I really like that as well. It looks a little bit more earthy rather than, this is non-colored, but it has a bit of that red tone to it, a slight, not red, but mm -hmm. you know, but there's, it's a little bit more rich in color. Um, but I would just recommend, you know, going with a mulch that is non-cypress. They have the, um, some of that Malaluca recycled mulch. That stuff is, um, it floats. So it, that's not really the best thing to use. That's so, been my experience. I tried that and it just all kind of went away. Um, the uh, pine needle, if you don't mind the pine needle, um, that actually has the same look of the cypress mulch in terms of the color when it's freshly put down, but it's just a different texture. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and that's renewable. That's just coming from pine needles. Drop it in the forest. Yes, it is. So I, I do really like that. We have a lot, some of the contracts. So I work with a variety of landscape install contractors, and a lot of them have. All right. Oh no. Okay. Oh no. We. I think we've lost Lee temporarily. Hopefully. Um. So. One more thing I'll say about mulch while we're waiting for Lee to sign back in is that the um, mulch also reduces the amount of watering you have to do for plants because it holds the moisture down. Um, whenever I do new plantings in the yard, I make sure to get mulch on those new plantings, not touching the base of the plants, but around where the roots are because the sun, especially in the summertime here, dries out these plants in the heat very quickly and new plantings with, before their roots are established, even the natives have a hard time surviving if you don't mulch and make sure they're watered uh, well. So um, I think that uh, mulch is a really important part of, your, of uh, your landscape. And I think it's a like putting in basic flower beds, mulching your beds is a clear win for, uh, for dressing your house up for curb appeal. Absolutely. Um, Lee and I are texting each other. She's working on signing back in. Um, let's see here. Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about um, clean beds? I mean, we've had some experience with that in our own yard, both here and our last home. Mm -hmm. So here's an example, I think, of the pine needles actually being used as a mulch. So if, for those of you that want to see what it looks like, I th this is what we have in our yard usually. Uh, is the pine needles. Um, and um, cleaning out your beds, getting rid of any, we, Florida stuff grows and you'll go in there and there'll be new bushes, there's volunteers, there's weeds. I have as many baby trees growing in our beds 
uh, as I do weeds. So going through and cleaning up that so that it's, you have this intentional clean space uh, is I think really important. And the other thing, um, and I'm gonna hand it back to Lee because I think she's joined us again, um, is, is coming up with the, the bordering of where your lawn and your planting beds are. If you can put in um, some, something to designate that space, a lot of times that really makes a big impact. Uh, this example of using some of our um, local limestone riprap, which you can easily buy uh, and have delivered to your house, just line the bed, um, I think makes a, makes a really nice, nice look here on Sanibel. I love that look. Yeah. So Lee, I don't know how much of that you caught, but is there anything else you'd like to add to this? Um, yeah, our internet was a little spotty, um, so we had dropped. But yes, I, I think I caught most of that. Um, again, kind of defining this space between your lawn area and the landscape bed with some sort of edge treatment. It could be this coral riprap, it could be um, a paver edge, it could be an aluminum straight edge, um, like with which was in one of the first slides, um, really does help to create an organized space. Um, and oftentimes just creating that nice curved line um, really calms the space and it just makes the entire space feel more organized from an aesthetic standpoint. But from a functional standpoint, it also allows, it keeps the mulch in place. The mulch isn't going to migrate over time um, the landscape mowers aren't going to mow into the mulch and blow the mulch because um, that's a big problem uh, with our blowers all the time. So this sort of treatment actually is really functional. Um, and then the city of Sanibel specifically, they will allow a hardscape edge bedline like this for I think um, 200 linear feet. You know, so you can do that in your own yard if you're um, concerned about hardscape. Um, or pervious and impervious and developed coverages, you can still add a landscape edge line um, without that impacting that. So, okay. That's great. I love that. Ah. There we go. So, this is a really great example of kind of those old shell like yards that we have more so on the east end or even um, in some communities off of West Gulf Drive. Um, you know, a completely rocked or shell yard. And I just wanted to share this because the photo on the left uh, was taken in January uh, or February, January. And um, we had kind of cleaned up the site in this photo, there are some other things that were there, but it already starts to look better when you get out the things that are not organized and just don't look good and you leave the plants and the palms that do look good. Um, you know, we have sable palms, which are native sables, and we kept those and we decided to create um, kind of a buffer between the road and the house um, using natives, a combination of the natives and some um, specimen plantings. So the before on the left looks way better than it did uh, when the client approached us. And then on the right is after, and this was probably two, probably a month after install. We, we did intentionally plant some pretty tall shrubs, but again, you can kind of see that we, we kept some gravel in the front along the road, and then we used the riprap to do a very clean edge line. We use a pine needle mulch, um, we layered the plantings using our cocoa plum hedge kind of as our backbone front and back of the landscape bed um, and then provided some privacy for the client by using some fairly young coconut palms um, and overall I mean it's it's a really great example of just transforming a landscape um, on Sanibel. We did go through the city of Sanibel for the approval process for this um, particular lot because it's on the corner of uh, Welk and Lingren. So it's very, you know, it's very exposed. It's a corner lot and um, they were right on the corner. They got all that season traffic all the time driving by. So they wanted some privacy and we did it using primarily natives. So 
So how long does that take to go through the process of permitting for a new landscape? That might be a trick question. Um, it, it really depends on the extent of the project. So specifically for this project, because it's um, kind of grandfathered in, it has already a U-shaped drive, which Sanibel does not allow us to put any um, U-shaped driveways in that have two uh, aprons or connection to the road. But if it's already existing, it's considered grandfathered in. So we had to go through that, you know, convincing them to try to keep that for this lot. Um, and then we had so much, um, you know, as you can see, rock down, there was no lawn. Um, mm -hmm. So we were improving the site by removing the rock and creating more landscape bed area. Um, and so for this, it was about a four week process. Just, we just did our plans, submitted them to the planning department, had a meeting with natural resources. Um, then we went, we got approval and we went forward with the install. Um, and then after install, we do have to submit, um, the project is complete, please come out and, and inspect the site. Um, so it, you know, it can vary, but um, for this, the initial was about like three to four weeks, so. Yeah, but what a difference that makes, not just from a, not just from an aesthetic standpoint, but from a functional standpoint, because that's going to reduce noise. It's going to provide privacy for the, the homeowners in their house because their mm -hmm. windows aren't going to be as exposed. Mm -hmm. And it'll make a huge difference to somebody who's coming and looking at those two properties for the, if they're looking to buy a property. I can tell yeah. you there's a big difference in the initial impression that that would make. Yep. Huge. So, and, you know, the last slide that we had, it was a 75% native. Uh, landscape that we did. This um, slide right here is another, um, this was a almost a complete remodel. Susan, I think you sold this property. Um, I did. A few years I back. Buttonwood, I think. Yes. 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 So we did this install. Um, during, literally got the coconut palms in and the palms that you can see installed two weeks before Hurricane Irma came through. Um, and this photo that you see here, I was on site probably three weeks ago and I just, I looked at it and it's just, it's still one of my favorite landscapes, um, on Sanibel, but, um, you know, it's just, you know, we have, uh, you know, a hurricane or a tropical storm slash category one kind of heading our direction right now. So it just brings back those memories, but this particular site, it, you know, we had most of the landscape in, it got ravaged by the hurricane, um, and it has rebounded impressively. Um, so that just goes, you know, we use primarily natives. There are some hints of color in here that are not native, but I, on Sanibel, it's just a careful um, uh, inclusion of some accent colors in, in with native landscape, and it can just look so great. Um, so. That's beautiful. And I love palm trees. So this, this landscape is, is gorgeous. And, yeah, and a lot of, and a lot of the things that aren't native, I think that you have in this are also like low water needs too. So, so I mean, the, some, some tropical plants people put in require a lot of water. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's others that can handle our dry winters without huge amounts of additional irrigation. So that's something to kind of consider as well, right? Exactly. This, this garden, um, you know, the bromeliads, even the philodendron siloam, once it's established, really doesn't need very much water. These palms, they don't need very much water. I mean, if we, we look at where these, some of these, you know, the thrinex are native, um, they just really need some water to get established. And once they're established, they are happier without water than with too much water. Um, and this is a really great example of a layered kind of a strolling garden. You know, we have a nice shell path that you can kind of walk through the front yard. Um, and it's, it's, we really don't put very much irrigation. He, the owner has a lawn in the back for their dog or had a lawn. I don't know what the rabbits have done. He, we've, we've been trying to fight that, but um, he's really thrilled with the front yard just because it's just, he wanted that Sanibel-esque kind of beach, not zero scape, but just not, not overly, um, overly manicured lawn. Mm -hmm. So the maintenance on this, you might think it's um, 
a lot. It's actually not. It's more hand, like hand trimming. Like you can't, on any of these plants, you cannot take a, you know, a hedge trimmer and just do that with this, which is why I love it. You know, it, it all has to be hand trimmed and it's only once a month do you actually have to do that. So. Right. It's, it's removing f palm fronds when they start yeah. to brown mm -hmm. and cutting back the bromeliads after they get a little bit they start to spread a little bit. That's or it. separating them and giving them to your neighbors. That's what I do <laughs> fine. I have some bromeliads. If any neighbors want them, let me know. Yeah. Happy to share. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, here's another view of this same property. So this is the same property, and this is looking um, from Buttonwood to the house. And the curb appeal to this one for me, it's more like a secret garden effect where, you know, we have an area of lawn along the road and we have a Calusia hedge that, you know, gives the owner privacy. But once you pull into the drive and it, the entire landscape opens up into this kind of strolling garden. And so it, this is a very good example of curb appeal. Um, you know, you can, do, you can do the buffer or you can, um, you know, keep a kind of open uh, landscape all the way through. But to me, this buffer really works very well for this particular property, so. Yeah, the buffers can be transformative to yards. They can mm -hmm. make them feel bigger a lot of times because they make your yard feel like a room that's an extension of your living space versus a pu all public area. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, and I'm just going to go to what you helped us achieve in our yard is we have our house is on a corner lot and um, a decent amount of our, our yard is along the side of the house, which is also alongside a residential street. <clears throat> and um, that side yard just didn't get a lot of use because it wasn't very private and it was, you know, because it was just it was open to the to the the street and with the putting in a buffer we have a buffer hedge it goes all the way down that side yard uh and it's mostly of native plants but those have grown in and in a couple really within a year or two years they formed a huge amount of privacy on our side yard and now our side yard is as private as our backyard maybe even more so uh because it's enclosed and we've got all, now I'm, I'm putting in my own gardening in there that's making it pretty, but it's, uh, it made it into another room, like an outdoor room for us to have that buffer in between our yard and, the, and you know, the public street. So, and I think it makes a big difference when you're in our house and you're on our back porch or you're walking in our backyard. Now it's all this space feels like private space that belongs to the house. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the, the buffers for that we do, we like to think of them as kind of like, if you're building a house, it's kind of like the foundation wall. And then we, we take that structure and then step down on the front and opposite side, the home side and the street side to, you know, kind of create our backdrop for the lower landscape, which is exactly what we did for your house. And I do think it was very successful. And that corner, I, we put the Bismarck in, that entire corner, it was so surprising because once we put that um, L-shaped buffer in, it, I, I didn't realize that your yard felt as big as it really did either. And that right. was an immediate uh, experience. Yes, it, it's strange because the buffer isn't super narrow, um, doesn't take up a huge amount of space, but it's, you know, there's a lot of plants in it, but as soon as we put that in, it made the yard feel bigger. And it also by the, what you did by putting a feature kind of out towards uh, a corner or, or farther part of it, it really drew the eye out over that way. So you felt like you had a lot more yard than you did before. So it's kind of interesting how that works if it's well planned. So it was a, that was a nice, nice thing. The buffer really made our yard feel like it, our family spends so much more time in our front yard and in our side yard. Now that we have a buffer uh, between us and the public space, it's, it, I mean, we never hung out in the front yard before really. I mean, there was a space to go between the car and the front door and that sort of thing. Now we have a pair of chairs that sits out there and we've not right now because it's hot, 
but when it's not quite as hot, we've, we've sat out in the yard in these chairs and enjoyed just sitting in our front yard because it's beautiful and it's, it's our, it's now it's our space. So. Yeah. Rain gardens. Rain gardens. So this is actually, this is another corner lot, ironically enough. Um, this is on South Yachtsman. Um, and we installed this rain garden, I would say January this year. Um, and so this particular client, yes, they have corner lot. They have tons of existing um, native sable palms. And honestly, they were tired of mowing and the maintenance with the mowing. Um, so we converted their swale for probably 120 feet of it into a rain garden. Um, and this to me is just a really great example of our native fakahatchee, our native ferns, um, coupled with some maybe non-natives. Uh, we have some jatropha and some of the fire, um, the fire spike in there, but all are plants that, you know, when planted in the proper location will thrive. Um, and it also dually functions to help the water infiltrate in that area. There's actually hardly any pooling water. Like before when it was just sod, you just would see the pooling water. And these plants actually literally soak it right up. Um, and you can also see that we used um, the native pine needle because it does not, rarely does it migrate and float unless we have a really heavy shed of rain from a heavy storm event. But um, so this, this is a great example. And this, um, the natives here, some of them will get tall enough where they will start to kind of create that separation of space from the immediate inner yard versus the street frontage. Um, but it is, it's a really beautiful example um, of a rain garden that's functioning very happily right now, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great way of taking a negative in the yard a place where you have sometimes get standing water from the heavy rains we get in the summertime and transforming it into a really beautiful space. And when you're talking rain gardens, you'll notice back that on that last slide that it's maybe not the most um, organized. You know, it's not linear. It's not one linear hedge and then another hedge. It's definitely not a formal feel. Um, rain gardens um, are not really by nature going to feel formal. So that is a, you know, just something that we like to educate um, any of our clients that are thinking that that's what they want um, about what the end result will be before we get into it. And they're like, well, that's not exactly what I was thinking. Um, but um, so I just wanted to share that. You know, I'd like to make a quick plug. SCCF has a landscaping center here on Sanibel. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to have a rain garden, for example, you could go and ask Sue or any one of the folks over there at SCCF, um, what would be the best type of plant for this particular area? And they're more than happy to help you out. They're a very good resource and they have really, really great quality plant material. Okay. Um, and one of, this one is a fun one. Um, this house is a Sanibel house. Um, we completed this, I would say, maybe eight months ago, seven, eight months ago. Um, and this was a complete remodel. Um, the entire house was remodeled. They built these garden walls and they, they really wanted this to feel more like, um, like a Spanish villa, kind of that experience of walking through a courtyard and having that experience before you get to the front door. So something like this actually really sets the tone uh, well before you ever get to the front door um, in terms of the curb appeal. Um, and you know, we incorporated a really beautiful tiered fountain um, and some really nice containers that sit up on their garden walls. Um, it, and you also see the seasonal color there and that is intentional, the seasonal color and some of the plantings in the containers we have the opportunity of switching those out season to season or every couple years um, to freshen things up. Um, not necessarily a really Sanibel friendly landscape, but they have a very big yard. So we are able to meet our 75, 25% uh, native to non-native ratio. I do feel that I need to say that this is just really one area, not everything in the entire property looks um, as colorful as this, so. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you very much, Lee, for taking the time with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, you're a wealth of knowledge for our community. Um, please reach out to Lee. This is her contact information. Um, she's always very giving with her time and her talent. Um, and we love the work you do. Yeah, well, before we break, I do have a question that, that has come up. Um, that I'd like I'd like to I like to bring up, um, and uh, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. When so we talked about all these things that you can do, and you know, we go to Home Depot and we buy these plants and we go put them in our yard and we try to do stuff. But when do you think it may? When should we go to? When should most people go to somebody like you versus trying to do it themselves? I mean, I know that answer is going to be different for different people, but let's say someone's inclined to do some, some type of work themselves. Um, when, when does it make sense for them to, to go to, to Lee um, and Costa Vista and say, help me out with this versus um, just trying to do it on my own? So there's a couple answers for that. Um, but I really think if you feel like you've tried everything and you're struggling, <laughs> reach out to us whether it's just for like a consult and just we'll walk the yard and kind of tell you. But sometimes um, just the sheer scope and scale of the project, really I would recommend um, at that point bringing in somebody, um, you know, if you want to redo your whole front yard, your whole backyard, or if you are um, doing sort of a remodel and repainting and, and adding on to the house or something like that, definitely contact us um, to help out with that um, it's there are definitely things that we tried to show that you can do yourself but um, you know if it if the project continues to grow and you just can't quite seem to get your arms around it I would just say reach out um, it's not it's not a direct answer but um, mm -hmm. you know it's or if you if there's anything that you are trying to do that would require any sort of a Sanibel permit process absolutely reach out. We don't have to redo the entire design, but we can help walk you through what the city is going to require or recommend. Um, you know, if you've got, you want to remove a couple palms and replant somewhere else or, a, a, you know, anything for permitting, anything for hardscape, um, and anything you just kind of feel like it's, it, it might have grown in scope uh, without you realizing it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, which is easy to happen. Yeah, it is. Yeah, as soon as you start doing it, you realize, well, if I'm going to do that, I, I probably should do this, and I might as well do that. Well, what I will, t what I will say from personal experience, I'm kind of a plant nut myself, so <laughs> I, I've done landscape. I've done I, in a house prior to living on Sanibel. I did most of the landscaping and did all the work, um, but uh, when we decided to redo our yard, we knew it was a big job and it was going to require some mature plants being put in and it was a lot of work and was well beyond what we could do. So it was pretty clear that we weren't going to try to do it ourselves. And I went and I tried um, talking to a land uh, uh, lawn care companies because they'll do installations for you and do, you know, they'll do a, a, a yard design and, and, uh, and do it for you. And there's different land care, you know, yard care companies. We, I went and I talked to um, nurseries um, and some of the nurseries had planning services and would be happy to, to do that for a fee or no fee if you bought the plants through them. And I went through a variety of different things. And I have to say that um, through a recommendation, we met Lee and um, what you brought to the table as far as expertise and knowledge and you gave me a lot of you gave us comfort that we were spending money the right way um and i have no question in my mind that you paid for yourself from a standpoint of avoiding mistakes um and or doing the wrong thing and I was also hesitant to spend money on some of the more mature plants of which we ended up putting in more larger specimens than I originally had wanted to, which costs substantially more. Um, but I knew that you weren't incentivized to sell me more and that more expensive plant you're telling me to do it was based upon your own experience and knowledge and that that's really what we want, that's really what we should do. 
and it was the right move. So we did end up spending some more money on some plant material than I had ever, than I had planned on, but there's no question that that was money well spent because the way it grew in and how healthy it is and how quickly we were able to enjoy the space, that, that that was money well spent. So those are some of the things that your expertise brought to the table that I thought was really helpful. And um, I think that if anybody out there is planning on doing a major landscaping job, um, that bringing in a professional to, um, and I don't even mean major, it could be just one bed. I, I don't know. Lee, what, what's too small of a job for you guys? There isn't one. I okay. mean, we, so I mean, I, my point is, is I think that even a, even if you had a small bed, you know, the expertise and not making a mistake and putting in plants that die or plants that get chewed up by rabbits, um, or things like that. I mean, that's, that's, that knowledge, um, is uh pays off in the end because even if we like plants and we go to home depot it's hard to envision what that plant's going to be like in two and three years whereas lee you and other professionals like you have a lot of experience with that and, they, and you know how you know what to put in and and what it's going to look like so and, and just to speak to that um and to add to that and thank you for those kind words um i mean that's that's really what we specialize in is planning out the design process so that the homeowner isn't doing one thing prior, putting the order of events in the correct order. We don't want you to be redoing anything because that is not money well spent. Um, we'd rather, if you are inclined to spend a little bit more, you know, figure out the feature items and let's put it towards that. But we are very good at doing, you know, assessing the quality of the landscape, assessing the um, intent of what the homeowner would like to do, um, the end vision, and, and then road mapping a way to get there with a design, an estimated opinion of cost. Uh, we can work with you for bidding it out to contractors. We can even be on site and offer the construction observation and layout um, services or just inspection of materials and making sure that um, what we specified and what you're expecting to get is on point. Um, and yeah, we, we work with a variety of different landscape contractors, um, you know, and we're independent. So um, we like that. We like to be, uh, to be able to say that, you know, we're guiding you um, and, you know, we're completely separate. So to Jim, I, I used to work for a design build company where you know, when we'd recommend something more, more quantity or bigger size, they're always asking, well, that's better for you anyway, right? And so now I don't have to navigate that question at all, so. Yeah. That's great. Anything else, Jim? Um, the only other question I said is that I, uh, and this is kind of a personal question and I kind of know the answer, but, Everybody else I spoke to pretty much called themselves a landscape designer, but you're a landscape architect. Now you answered that in the beginning as far as the fact that you went to school for that and it's um, a landscape designer has no certification or qualification. It's just what somebody calls themselves. Is that correct? Like I could be a landscape designer or do I have to pass a course? I'm, I think it's a fairly loose term, but there are different um, courses that one could take, like a Master Gardener course, or become certified through the Florida Nursery Growers Association as a landscape designer. The mm -hmm. FNGLA is uh, the nursery growers um, uh, industry, um, but, and you can take courses, um, and there are really great garden designers who are not landscape architects. Um, landscape architects do everything from hardscape and and you know, uh, public plazas and you know things that are not just softscape related. Um, so, but yeah, there is a very big difference between maybe what the land care, landscape mowing person, and maintenance person is going to bring to the table versus you know a landscape architect um, mm -hmm. or a licensed designer. Um, mm -hmm. So, there's different levels for sure. All right, great. That's all I have. Great. Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, please don't forget to give Lee a call if you have any questions. And as a reminder, Jim and I are with McCallion and McCallion Realty uh, here on Sanibel and Captiva Islands and also in Southwest Florida. We have an office in Fort Myers. Visit us at sanibelrealestateguide.com or gulfcoasthomeguide.com. 
um, and give us a shout out if you have any questions or need some help with real estate. Take care. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.